and let's go. So good afternoon, everyone. And I would uh, really like to welcome everyone on behalf of Bedfordshire Hospitals. I hope you all are having a good time as well. Uh, today, we all are going to speak about something really interesting and something which is very important. I must say, especially for since my medical school days as well, I was always a very curious person like, what is this ECG? Uh, what is happening? Can we make some conclusions? Uh, how can we make some conclusions? How can it literally help us to make a decision, especially about uh, the clinical condition of a patient as well. So this is something very basic. And I must uh, say to everyone, whatever field you may go, whatever specialty you may go, you will definitely come across uh, this uh, tool and technology for sure. And there's no option later on once you will be asked that, okay, uh, you don't know at all about it. So that's why I would really request everyone to focus about it. And let's try to learn, I would say. Okay. So a simple question is, what is actually an ECG, isn't it? Can anyone try to say? I'm sure you all would have already seen an ECG. Uh, uh, anyone would like to try as well? And one thing I must say, I mean, don't be, don't hesitate yourself and all. This is the time for everyone to, you know, contribute to the lecture we all learn together. And yes, this is indeed the time to make some mistakes so that we all will learn together, okay? So anyone would like to try, what is actually an ECG? Okay, I can see the chat box. Wonderful. Abby, great response, I would say. Good. Helen, a chart that describes the electrical activity of the heart. Indeed. So I'm glad like you all have been through, in fact. So ECG tends to actually measure the potential difference of the electrical fields. So as you can already understand, ECG stands for electrocardiogram. So it is about the electrical activity of the heart, and we are trying to record it. Does anyone recall who is the person who had invented it? And I must say, I feel fortunate enough to, I did my EP training. So those are the cardiologists who specialize in the heart arrhythmia. So uh, it was just at one hour distance from there. I'll give you guys another hint as well. Beh I mean, after that scientist's name, the whole city has been named. And in fact, that's the headquarters for a company like Philips. Any guesses? No one would like to guess? Wonderful, you're absolutely right. That's the city of Eindhoven. So Eindhoven is the one who demonstrated in one of the London meetings about the uh, ECG. It used to be a very huge instrument. And if you will try to see those pictures and all, I'm sure you would have already seen. So it used to be the size of a big room, in fact. And this is what is the typical evolution of a device or tool or technology as well. So what happens is uh, this is a machine which is a sensitive electromagnet which can detect and record the changes in the electromagnetic potential. So like all the typical ones, it also has a positive and a negative uh, potential, which as I said, it, it will be having a positive pole. There will be a negative pole with electrode extensions on the either end. And the paired electrode is the one which will be constituting a lead. So now, since we already, uh, we have a very smart audience, I can already figure it out. So you all are aware about Eindhoven. So there's something called as Eindhoven strangle as well. So what happens is if this is a someone, you know, for our reference. So as I already said, there will be a positive end, there will be a negative end. So the current tends to flow from negative to the positive, okay? So as you can already notice, 
Um, can someone try to comment about what are the different leads which we use? How many leads are there, for example? Does anyone recall? Uh, uh, I'm sure you all would have seen uh, someone undergoing an ECG. So there will be different leads as well for that, isn't it? Exactly. Good, Abby. Good answer. Indeed. So as you already said, it is there are 12 leads for that. Uh, and there are different names as well. So what happens is, as you can notice, so these are the different leads, what I'm trying to point it out, okay? And so there's lead one, which tends to extend from the right to the left arm. And then there's lead two, which tends to extend from the right arm to the left foot. And of course, finally is the lead three, which you can see it tends to extend from the left arm to the left foot as well. So other than these uh, limb leads, what we call it as, there is, what are the other leads which is called as? So 12 leads, someone already gave the answer. There are limb leads and what else? What are those other leads as well? There is something called as limb leads. And as I already showed you in one of the diagrams, what is called as chest leads as well. So V1, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. Okay. And there will be something is called as augmented uh, limb leads as well. So AVL, AVR, AVF, and lead one, lead two, lead three. Okay. So six limb leads, six chest leads. So if we are going to put them all together, so these are the type of recordings which we are going to notice. So anyone would like to guess, is this ECG normal or some abnormality is there? So what is literally happening? Good one, Helen, as you already said, it chest leads indeed. So what is happening in this ECG? Do you think is it normal or is it something is abnormal? We'll try to get an answer about it in the, towards the end. And I must say, this is abnormal ECG. So as I was already telling you, uh, there are different leads, what we call it as a limb leads, chest leads. Now you already understand the Eindhoven's lead as well, but it is very important for us to be able to understand the electrical axis. Electrical axis, because not only it will be able to understand the depolarization wave through which the, uh, the electrical potential is going through, it will also help you in understanding the possible origin where, because sometimes there will be heart rhythm problems in which it may be important to be able for us to be able to distinguish what is the possible site of origin so that on the basis of that, we can try to determine the treatment for that heart rhythm problem as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, not just uh, able to locate it, but also the treatment, as I said it. And also to determine the future course of those diseases as well. And that's why it is very important. So about its axis, if you may be able to notice it well over here, so these are the one, two, and three, which I said it. So this is a zero degree, 60 degree, 120, then this is 180, of course. And then on the other side are the negative, okay? So it will be minus 60, minus 120, okay? So on the, this side is all positive, this side is all negative. So if you try to put them all together, the heart will literally become like an axis. So for example, it will always depend. So this is the fine line, I would say. So what I try to really remember is the lead one, two, lead three. And of course, in between, you can point it out. The middle will be around, you know, of course, the middle between 120 and 180 will be 150, right? Similarly, between the 60 and 120 will be 90 degree. So which is going to point towards those augmented limb leads, the AVL for the left side, AVF for the foot, 
if we are for the right side. So once we understand this, so uh, the lead axis is the direction actually generated by the different uh, orientation of the paired electrodes. So once we are able to understand, and that is very, very important, as I was telling you. So if this is the basic skeleton of an ECG deflection, which tends to represent the vectors, which have two things. It has a magnitude and also a direction. So magnitude, as we can see, uh, I'll try to show you some further examples as well. So some of the segments, what we all should be able to understand is we can see the PVF, QRS complex, and then comes the T wave. So then you can further, of course, divide them into different intervals, as you can already see the PI interval, the QT interval, and the QRS complex. So PI intervals refers to the time interval between starting from the P to the starting of the QRS complex. QRS is, refers again to the starting of the QRS, uh, Q, and the end of the S wave. Then similarly, something is called as ST segment. So ST segment is very important a lot of times if you're trying to see for the, is it ischemia, is it infarct, or is it some other problem as well? It will be quite a lot important and to help us distinguish. So as I was telling you about the P wave, if we will notice over here, it tends to show or comment about the atrial activation. Normally, the normal axis for this will be minus 50 to 60 degrees. Similarly, then we can notice the PI interval, as I was telling you. So this is the time for intraatrial, AV nodal, and the his Purkinje conduction. So on a normal basis, the duration for this can be around 0.12 to 0 0.20 seconds. And, and over here, as I already emphasized to you, is the QRS complex, which tends to reflect the ventricular activation. And uh, we should keep something in mind that heart, the distance between the heart and the ECG leads is significant in the sense that there is a pericardium over there, then comes those muscular regions, there is visceral tissue is there, then there are bones as well, muscles are there, then finally comes the skin, and then comes those electrodes. So only 10 to 15%, which is recorded on the surface of the total ventricular activation. And about the axis, I had already said it to you, if you may recall the Eindhoven strangle, the normal QRS axis is minus 30 to plus 90 degrees. Don't forget, a lot of people may easily get it confused that, you know, why the minus is also being covered. So we should try to understand our heart is, heart is slightly rotated. So that's why the normal axis for the heart is considered as minus 30 to plus 90 degrees. And the normal duration, so uh, how much should be the QRS complex, for example, is less than 120 milliseconds. Or in seconds, if you're trying to tell, in, it will be less than 0.12 seconds. Similarly, uh, if we are trying to look on the ECG paper, one of the key important things which we all should not miss is the Q wave, which we see over here. The Q wave should ideally be less than 0.04 seconds wide and also less than 25% of the QRS height. Why I'm telling is because a lot of times you may come across someone that, uh, okay, you are just seeing a patient in the clinic and then you notice like, oh, there's some abnormality I can see on the ECG. And then you see that, okay, there's a Q wave. So you, on the basis of that, you will have to make a diagnosis. So this is why it is very important to be able to understand. So once you understand the Q wave, you will be able to further um, initiate or consider what kind of treatment would you like to start as well? What kind of medications may be pretty helpful as well? So now comes the QT interval. QT interval is further important is because a lot of those patients uh, will be getting affected uh, whenever someone is taking any medication and all. So what is called is uh, there is a Bezit's formula. We call it as QTC, as you can already see. It is the ratio of QT divided by root of RI interval. So on a normal basis, this is the normal range, but we must say that 
children and females can have slightly longer, which will still consider as, as normal interval. So regarding the ST segment is the one which tends to represent the greater part of the ventricular repolarization. And then comes the T wave. T wave is the one which tends to represent the ventricular repolarization, which will be having the same axis as QRS complex. And uh, if sometimes you may also notice what is called as a U wave, uh, it is actually like a negative after potential, uh, which is more obvious, of course, when the QTC is shorter. I think uh, you all are already the masters of cardiac anatomy, and I'm sure uh, you guys understand about it uh, more than me. So can anyone recall uh, what are the different components of the cardiac induction pathway? Please feel free to use the chat box. I always believe, uh, uh, like I was at Harvard Medical School as well in way back in 2014, um, uh, to uh, learn about the advanced medical teaching techniques for medical students. Mm -hmm. Then I learned it. What was said to me was, it's learning is always a two-way process. More you interact, more you will be able to learn. Does anyone recall those conduction system? Now I'm sure if you'll see this, you all will recall that, okay, here is the sinus, sinoatrial node, which later on goes to the his bundle, then bifurcating into the left bundle branch, further bifurcating on the other side to right bundle branch. And the left bundle branch is the one which will divide further into the left anterior fascicle and the left posterior fascicle. So the resting membrane potential is very important for us to be able to understand the, about the cardiac ion channels because the, these are the ones which will be able to determine the cardiac action potential and the specific pathological conditions. As I was, and as you all might have already heard about something like a long QT syndrome. Mm -hmm. And similarly, when we are trying to target the treatment uh, for these um, heart rhythm problems. Uh, so if we try to use an antiarrhythmic drug, then we will try to target uh, those specific segments. So cardiac ion channels, they are actually like transmembrane proteins with specific conductive pro properties, which can be voltage gated or ligand gated or even time dependent. And they are the ones which allow passive transfer of sodium, potassium, calcium, or chloride ions across the cell membranes. Okay. So this is what is the typical cardiac action potential looks like. I cannot re-emphasize its importance. Um, anyone would like to share what are the different phases which we can notice over here? I still recall, at least uh, <laughs> in physiology days, um, in the early, uh, years of my me medical school, we were supposed to get master to it. So if you may notice what is happening is there are different phases and they, it is related to those different cardiac ion channels, which is happening. So uh, to make it easier for you, what happens is there, there is alteration of the transmembrane conduction uh, triggers, which tends to trigger the depolarization. And unlike other excitatory phenomenon, the cardiac action potential has prominent plateau phase and spontaneous space-making capacity. And that's what tends to make it really interesting, especially for the cardiac cells. So I will be a nice person. I will give you the numbers. So if you can notice, here is the phase zero in which there is a net sodium depolarizing inward current and calcium depolarizing inward current. So both these currents are in, inwards, okay? Then comes is the phase one, where there's a potassium transient inward current, okay? Oh, sorry, outward current. And then comes is the phase two. As you can already notice, phase two is about calcium depolarizing inward current. And there is a sodium calcium exchange as well. 
And then after the phase two, of course, will come the phase three, in which there's potassium delayed rectifier current with slow and fast components. And then finally comes is the phase four. Phase four refers to the sodium pacemaker current and the potassium inward rectifier currents. So as I said, it is, these are the ones which not only have a important role in determining the membrane potential, but also similarly when we are trying to treat using the heart rhythm problems, we will have to focus. And so it, they also further determine the mechanism of heart arrhythmias as well. So on an overall basis, broad basis, we are trying to uh, classify the one of the first mechanisms is automaticity. Okay, so the automaticity, uh, it tends to raise the resting membrane potential by increasing the phase four depolarization and lowering the threshold potential. For example, increased sympathetic tone, hypokalemia, myocardial ischemia. Then the other uh, next a common mechanism which we all come across is triggered activity. So in the triggered activity, uh, it tends to happen from the oscillations in the membrane potential after an action potential, what like early after depolarization, which tends to happen in conditions like the Tosard's depointers, which may be induced by the drugs, or even the delayed after depolarizations, which may be happening to secondary two mechanisms like the digitalis or catecholamines as well. And, but last but not the least is the reentry mechanism, which is from slowed or blocked conduction. So which will be causing reentry circuits, which may involve nodal tissue or accessory pathways. So what will happen is um, on a, uh, see we all are, I think most of us are all clinicians okay, or would be interested in what about the clinical implications as well for this. So on a normal basis, we can dif differentiate the ECGs into bradycardia or tachycardia, or the tachycardias can be into narrow QRS tachycardia, broad complex tachycardia. In a simple basis, I would say to you all, if in doubt, always treat any ECG as wide complex tachycardia. As I said, always if in doubt, but there may be sometimes broad complex tachycardia, which may not be ventricular tachycardia as well, like SVT or with under branch block or with accessory pathway as well. So if you are there in the clinic, there are different ways how to uh, treat that as well. On the basis of ECG, you will be able to find out capture beats or fusion beats. And there are a lot of hints as well, which will be able to further help you to be able to differentiate it. Like, is it... Uh, 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 really a supraventricular tachycardia or is it a ventricular tachycardia? That's what is very, very important. So for example, if you come across someone who has had a history of myocardial infarction or maybe an elderly person, chances of a ventricular tachycardia is going to be, of course, higher. However, if there's a younger person, chances of uh, supraventricular tachycardia will be more, okay? Exceptions are always there. I always, um, I was always, uh, I have always learned, especially in my last two decades of passage of medicine, that more higher you go, um, there will be more and more exceptions. Nothing is perfect in field of medicine. Exceptions are always there. The only thing is, it's all relative. Means how much. Sometimes you may not know, not know those exceptions. Sometimes you may be aware of those exceptions. So now about the narrow complex tachycardia. Anyone would like to summarize some of them? What are the different narrow complex tachycardias? I'm sure you would have seen a, something like a sinus tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, AVNRT, or AVRT or intraatrial tachycardias as well. So they all will be narrow complex tachycardia. It's all due to the QRS width, okay? So if it is less than 120 milliseconds, we call it as narrow complex tachycardia, as I already gave you an example. Anyone would like to try? Okay, <laughs> answer is already there on your screen, which you can see. 
And as I said, it is you try to look for the cures width, and then you can call it like, is it really narrow cures or is it a wide cures? So as I was telling you, so in this, you always try to see for the P wave. If the P wave is after the R wave, okay, if there is one to one conduction, then you can think of something like a AV. RT or AV and RT as well. So if there's a very short RP interval, so if you may notice over here, so there's a retrograde P wave over here. Yeah. If you look carefully, and that's why this is negative, especially in this last second deflection over here, it is quite a lot clear. So this is a long RP tachycardia. This is how we try to do it, especially in the ER. If you are there, you can try to use uh, Admosin, which will uh, be helpful quite a lot to differentiate as well. Otherwise, sometimes you may try to use uh, the, uh, if someone is having a hemodynamic compromise, you may have to do a cardioversion for the patient as well. Okay. So for unstable tachycardia patients, whenever in doubt, do not hesitate to do a cardioversion. Okay. So ventricular tachycardia, as I had said it, this is how it typically it looks like. And I would really suggest, so this is a Facebook group as well, if you are interested in heart arrhythmias and all. So there are thousands of members uh, from everywhere in the world who all are there. And you can join the group. And of course, we all try to learn together, share some interesting cases, um, updates and arrhythmias and all as well. So what do we notice on this ECG? Anyone would like to give a try? So um, I think on an overall basis, we have already given uh, a good idea what is about the ECGs and all, and what are the clinical aspects of it as well. Uh, so now we will be going into more of a quiz, like so you all can try to see what or how it looks like, especially those ECG recordings. And if at any moment, if the connection gets off, we will stop the lecture at that moment. In the next week, when we are trying, uh, when we will be dealing with the next lecture, I will um, uh, like I'll reserve uh, initial five to ten minutes only for the discussion. If you guys are going to have any questions, are there any questions so far? Are there any questions so far? So as I said, it, if there will be further remaining questions, we will always discuss it in the uh, next session, okay? Whenever, if it stops, uh, the connection may stop in another like five to seven minutes or something like that. So if we look carefully, what do we notice? So definitely there, it looks like some tachycardia is going on, heart rate is pretty fast, okay? And then we notice like these QRS complex, it becomes even quite a lot faster. Isn't it? It becomes very fast and it becomes bizarre rhythm. So this is what is called as a two SARS the point is or polymorphic VT. If you come across this ECG, you must be alert, ready to give a shock to the patient. What about this ECG? So for example, this is ECG is from a patient who already had a myocardial infarction and um, then slowly he's doing well, everything is fine. You were called up like, hey doc, can you please have a look on the ECG? So if you look carefully, this is a broad complex. Yeah, this is a broad complex and this is with left bundle branch block. Why is it? I'll give you a mnemonic. It is called as William. So if you see W in the V1 and M in the V6, this is left bundle branch block. Then comes marrow. If it is M in V1, and W in V6, it will be right bundle branch block. You will now never forget, never get confused, uh, I'm sure, for the bundle branch block. Hopefully, we will do more sessions about uh, the ECGs as well. But there is no P wave. After such a history, so this is what is called as characteristic accelerated idioventricular rhythm. So ventricular tachycardia uh, ma uh, management and all, I'm not going to speak about it because this is uh, currently out of uh, your uh, purview or the lecture wise as well. Similarly, atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is one of the most common heart arrhythmia, uh, which is there. And uh, 
it, you all will come across, not just if you are there in the emergency room or you are there in the clinic or anywhere if you are there, you will be coming across this kind of ECG. And as I said, it is, uh, so in the simple words, if it is less than two days, yes, uh, you can consider to cardiovert either with elect uh, electrical cardioversion or pharmacological cardioversion as well, or similarly, if it is more than two days, you should try to consider if the patient needs any anticoagulation or um, the other medications as well, like that, okay? Then, for example, it comes as atrial flutter. Atrial flutter is an ECG, which I had already showed it to you, is the one which is characterized by sawtooth waves. So if you see a sawtooth wave, that is the one which will be atrial flutter. So now in this ECG, okay, the diagnosis is already there, but we should always try to understand why, why is it called as. So what is happening is, if we look carefully, what is happening is we can still see the P waves, isn't it? Isn't it over here? We can see the P waves. However, if we look carefully in this, the P wave morphology is of different types. So if there are more than three different P wave morphology with a varying PP interval and PI intervals, this is what is a characteristic of multifocal atrial tachycardia. And this is most commonly uh, seen in the COPD patients or the pneumonia patients. And yes, you can prefer a calcium channel blocker for those kind of patients. So what is happening in this ECG? Anyone would like to try? So I've already given some hint as well. There are some arrows, uh, if you will look carefully over here. So there are some arrows pointing. What are they pointing to? So those arrows are actually pointing to the P waves. So now, what the, so what do you notice? What is the relationship between the P waves and the QRS? Is it fixed or not fixed? So there's dissociation of the P waves and the QRS complex. Exactly, good, David. Very well done, well done. Good thinking. So they are not fixed, they are dissociated. So dissociation of the P and the QRS complex, especially in a wide QRX, what will you think for? You already learned. This is ventricular tachycardia. So now some more examples. You all are doing so good. So what is happening in this? So if any kind of ECG is what are the uh, point by point approach I try to do is, I will try to say for the rate. So rate, we can try to calculate using the number of boxes. So if there's only a single big box, it will be 300. If it is two big boxes, it will, between the RO intervals or any interval which you are taking, it will be 150 boxes. So on the basis of that, you can divide into that and you can even get an approximate range of the heart rate. Heart rate. So this is definitely tachycardia, isn't it? The heart rate is more than 100. Rhythm. So is it sinus rhythm or not sinus rhythm? Sinus rhythm, as I was telling you, there should be P, then followed by QRS, and then the T wave. So it is difficult to be able to notice. Or So what happens is if you will try to see, look carefully, there is P wave, then QRS, and T wave. So this is like a sinus. And then what? What is happening is we can further notice William. So this is like a left bundle branch block. Okay? So what we will call it as? So this is a wide QRS tachycardia, but without AV dissociation. So I would call it as a, like a tachycardia is definitely there, but with wide QRS, but there's no VA dissociation. So this will be called as a supraventricular tachycardia, but with aberrancy, okay? So why I'm trying to see, uh, 
give you a little bit extra bonus today because later on when you will be seeing or coming across these ecgs you will be able to say that yes i know this ecg i have seen this ecg it will be there somewhere okay wonderful so uh, we will stop the session today and as i said it if there will be any questions we will answer in the next session are there any further questions if there are any further questions feel free to email it to me as well and as i said it is we will answer them in the uh, next session okay thank you so much take